Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I have got to begin by saying a huge thank you to Jamie and all the folks at Free Thought Oasis in Amarillo, Texas, was there for a presentation and signing this last Saturday. We were in the unbelievable Legacy Lecture Hall at West Texas A&M. They just finished the facility last fall, and it's freaking unbelievable. It's absolutely amazing, and we had a great, great day. Thank you to everybody who came out. Our next stop's tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. Going to be in San Antonio, Texas, here on the 27th at the Radius Center. On Thursday, the 28th in Houston, Texas, at the Fox and Hound English Pub and Grill. And then wrapping up the week at the American Atheist National Convention. Now, the two stops beforehand are totally free. And everybody's welcome. Please come, bring friends. It's going to be great. And then the convention you do buy tickets for, I think there are still some left. You can go to atheist.org to find out more about that. On tonight's show, you know, I'm asked a lot from people about um, what's my take on a literal Jesus? Like, they know I'm an atheist, but do you think there was a guy named Jesus Christ who walked the earth. And I'll I'll admit to copping out. I mean, I just quite often will shrug and say, look, it's been 2,000 years. And quite frankly, it's been demonstrated that the scriptures are contradictory and nonsensical and ridiculous. And I know I'm convinced that the God-man, Jesus Christ, did not exist. And that's my own perspective on it. So if the God-man the deity, the son of Yahweh, the one who came and, and died and rose again and has unlimited power and omniscience and all that stuff. If he doesn't exist, then everything else is kind of academic. And that's kind of the tack I've taken. I mean, we can claw at the, is Jesus a real guy argument all day, but it hasn't really been my particular fight. But it is a compelling topic and everybody's got an opinion. And I'm amazed at how many people say they've got the the absolute proof. Of course, the religious websites say so. Beginningandend.com. The website said that Jesus Christ was the most documented and historically verifiable figure in antiquity, which is amazing because it happened before the invention of the video camera. Other websites like SoWhatAboutJesus.com, which, by the way, is in my top five for crappiest web design of the year. It's just don't even bother. Just just take my word for it. Uh, you've got JesusEvidence.com, and of course, you've got the gold standard, Answers in Genesis and the Discovery Institute. And conversely, there are other websites that say, no, it didn't happen. JesusNeverExisted.com charges that Nazareth wasn't even around in the first century, so there could not have been a Jesus of Nazareth. And the website also states that the 12 disciples are just as fictitious as the man Jesus. Nobelief.com weighed in and said, no, Jesus did not exist. The claims of an actual Jesus figure all derive from hearsay. And as our courts of law don't allow hearsay, we shouldn't allow it to prove anything. And you can read the full argument. There was an article for American Atheists written a while back by Frank R. Zindler called Did Jesus Exist? And I'll include the link to the article in the description of this show. And he lists a number of figures who lived during the time or within a century after the time that Jesus was supposed to have lived. And it ranges from Josephus to Apollonius to you name it. I mean, there must be 50 names here. And I'll read the bottom of uh, that clip. It says, according to the author who compiled these names, Enough of the writings of the authors named in the foregoing list remains to form a library, yet in this mass of Jewish and pagan literature, 
aside from two forged passages in the works of a Jewish author and two disputed passages in the works of Roman writers, there is to be found no mention of Jesus Christ. Nor, we may add, do any of these authors make note of the disciples or apostles, increasing the embarrassment from the silence of history concerning the foundation of Christianity. And again, you can read the entire article via the link. I won't take all that time here. Historian and professor Bart Ehrman recently released a book called Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth. Did an interview with NPR last April. And uh, he said, quote, Paul knew Jesus' brother James, and he knew his closest disciple Peter, And he tells us that he did, Ehrman said. If Jesus didn't exist, you would think his brother would know about it. So I think Paul is probably pretty good evidence that Jesus at least existed. Now, Ehrman said himself that the gospel does not present a historically accurate portrait of Jesus Christ. But he uses his book to essentially present the case that Jesus wasn't merely conjured up out of thin air. And uh, there's a YouTube interview. I'll give you that link as well hosted by a page called Christianity Triumphs, where they interviewed him on the subject of Did Jesus Exist? And we'll talk about Ehrman. By the way, I've invited Bart Ehrman to the podcast several times. I know he's a crazy busy guy, and I know he's got his own thing going. But like once a year for three years, I've sent him a message and saying, please, I would be honored if you'd come and do the show. And every time he has politely declined, and that's very cool. You know, he, has, he doesn't owe me a guest shot on the show. But just know that... I have I've extended that invitation. It remains wide open. Hopefully sometime in the next year or so, I'll get a chance to get Bart Ehrman on the show. Tonight's guest is the renowned author of Sense and Goodness Without God, Proving History and Not the Impossible Faith, as well as a number of articles online and In print, he's got a Ph.D. in ancient history from Columbia University. He specializes in the modern philosophy of naturalism, the origins of Christianity, and the intellectual history of Greece and Rome. His particular expertise in ancient philosophy, science, and technology. He's an activist. He's a debater. He was once even on Lee Strobel's talk show back in 2004, a show called Faith Under Fire. He went head-to-head with none other than apologist William Lane Craig. One of my favorite credits for my guest tonight is the fact he is listed in Warren Allen Smith's book, Who's Who in Hell? A handbook and international directory for humanists, free thinkers, naturalists, rationalists, and non-theists. Dr. Richard Carrier, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to shaking your hands uh, at the 50-year anniversary convention of the American Atheist. It's, I think, what, you're the headliner, and then there's like um, like 15 <laughs> warm-up acts, or how's that work? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm one of the warm-up acts, apparently. No, there, there's quite a lot of people uh, who are going to be speaking and performing there. It's, it's going to be an amazing gala, I mean, on a much bigger scale than I thought it would be. So it's going to be pretty awesome. You do a lot of this kind of thing around the country, right? You spend a lot of time on stage. What do you normally speak about? Is it about the history of Scripture? Do you speak about Jesus Christ himself? What's your specialty? What's been your subject of late, especially? Well, I do lots of things, actually. I love to vary it up. I've given talks. For example, I published an article in German Studies Review exposing the shoddy translation of Hitler's table talk that often gets used to prove that Hitler was an atheist and expose that the translation is so terrible that when you look at the original German, it says something completely different. Uh, And so I've given talks on that subject, which is, you'd think, well, that's really out there compared to the other things I do. Uh, But the main things I usually do are ancient history and philosophy. And and those are two different tracks. I talk in different respects on each of those. In philosophy, I've talked about worldview theory and things like that, like why should we be a naturalist? Um, I've talked about cosmology and stuff like that. And moral theory. I'm, I'm a big figure in terms of discussing moral realism from an atheist perspective. So I've done that. In the ancient history area, though, I've done my, my thing that I really love doing, which is ancient science and technology. And I've given talks on that a lot. And I've given it just on ancient science and technology. I've also given it on ancient Christian attitudes towards science and technology and comparing and contrasting pagan and Christian values with regard to science in antiquity. So I've done things like that. But then, of course, people love to hear me talk about religion and the origins of Christianity, and I've, I've acquired a lot of expertise in that field as well. So I do talk about the Bible. Just recently in North Carolina, I gave a talk in Raleigh on why the Gospels are myth, talking about the literary analysis of the Gospels and their literary structure and, and other attributes of them that mark them 
indicate that they are actually myths and not straightforward biographies, as we would normally say. With your permission, that's sort of the tack I want to take tonight. I mean, we... It gets even better. <laughs> Christianity is, is my background, so I'm guilty. Yeah. I mean, everybody's like, why don't you talk about Islam? Why don't you talk about Scientology? Why don't you talk about... I it's can speak to Christianity because it is my background and it is sort of my passion. And in my culture, when I came from the Christian church, they would just toss it out. They would just say, oh, well, obviously the Bible's historical fact. I mean, okay. historians have proven that the Bible is historical. And then, of course, there are no sources for that. Uh, but... <laughs> But it's, it's very effective to those who are ready to be spoon-fed this type of thing from the pulpit. Oh, the pastor says the Bible's historical fact. You don't say it's, ah, oh, it's somewhat corrupt. You say right off the bat, it's myth? <laughs> yes, the Gospels, certainly. And I can make that case pretty thoroughly. And I did that. That video will be online at some point. Uh, they're editing it now. But short, just the next day, I went down to Greensboro, North Carolina, and I gave a talk on why I think Jesus did not even exist. Uh, so, I mean, those are two different things, because the Gospels can be complete myth, and there could still have been a historical Jesus that the myths are about. It's a different question whether he existed or not. So I've also given talks on that, and I've, of course, I have one book out now, Proving History, which addresses th the problem in Jesus' studies, that the arguments that are made for his existence are based on invalid thinking and, and often factually incorrect claims. And that book documents that. My next book, which will come out by the end of this year, which is On the Historicity of Jesus Christ, will confront this head on. And will basically detail the reasons why I think we can conclude that Jesus probably did not even exist in our normal understanding of the concept. That, in fact, he originated as a sort of celestial being who was communicated with the, the first Christians thought through dreams and hallucinations and through visions and so forth. And that he was placed on earth in the stories the same way other celestial gods were placed on Earth in historically-based stories. But it's complete myth. There were actually, none of those things actually happened. There wasn't an actual earthly Jesus preaching in Galilee. Th those things are inventions. Bart Ehrman, as I understand it, would disagree with that. I know he's done some, some writing on the subject. I'm sure you've been queried about that. Do you want to address it? Oh, yes. In fact, the position that I'm talking about, there may be a handful of us scholars in the field who have qualifications in the field who agree with this, who are on board with what I'm talking about. Most scholars are still on the old traditional tack that there was a historical Jesus, even if the Gospels are substantially myth. Uh, that, that So it's just a question of figuring out what we can know about that historical Jesus, but there certainly was one, is, is their position. And Ehrman, of course, is a big champion of that widespread mainstream view. Unfortunately, when he came out with a book on this, Did Jesus Exist?, it was a really terrible book. It read like an armchair book that he just spun off in a couple weeks without seriously researching it, without being careful about how he worded things. And even his logical reasoning in it is both fallacious and inconsistent. So it's actually one of the worst defenses of historicity. There are actually better ones out there that you could look at. And so anyway, I, I wrote a really scathing and detailed review documenting the errors he made and the illogical aspects of it and, and things like that. And then he responded to some of the points in that, and then I responded and so on. And uh, basically, he stopped talking to me on the subject. Uh, but if you want to, if people want to catch up on that and see where that state of the debate is between Bart Ehrman and myself, just Google my name, Richard Carrier, Ehrman's name, E-H-R-M-A-N, and the word recap, R-E-C-A-P. Just do that. The first thing that comes up will be the Ehrman on historicity recap. And that's my summary of where things are. And that links to all the other stuff that he wrote and I wrote on this subject. I'll admit to you, I'm, in, I'm reading a couple of Ehrman's books right now, one being Jesus Interrupted. So if I was to read a book with Ehrman's research and I read yours, I'm going to read two essentially different conclusions. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, absolutely. On this subject, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and it's important you bring up his other work because his other books are really good. And in fact, I still recommend Jesus Interrupted as the standard reference book that laymen should read. If you want to be up to speed on what the mainstream consensus is in New Testament studies, that is the book to read. He's he, he, very good at explaining it. He's correct in explaining that even when, when I think things in it are wrong, nevertheless, he's correct in saying that those are the mainstream view, that those are the consensus views of scholarship. So it's a very valuable book. It's a well-written book. And, it's, and there might be a few other minor errors in there, but it's, it's nothing to be too concerned about. It's the one book that he wrote, Did Jesus Exist?, that was just really sloppily done. Very uncharacteristic for a lot of his previous work. Uh, otherwise, he usually does a pretty good job at summarizing the mainstream view on things. His book called Forged, for example, is a really good book on why we think uh, a lot of the letters, the epistles in the New Testament are forgeries. And if you want to see the case made for that, you want to see why mainstream scholars, the general consensus view is that, that's the book to read. And it's really good. And he really does take on a lot of the sort of the Christian apologetic claims that try to deny this. 
and he, he confronts them and, and exposes through a little bit of good research showing why they aren't valid. How often do you volley claims from people who throw out something like the Dead Sea Scrolls or I hate to say the Shroud of Turin? You probably hear these, right? It's proof Jesus existed. And then you must respond how? Well, in the Shroud of Turin, that's just a joke. That's tinfoil hat stuff, really. Yeah. These scrolls often that, that depends on exactly what their claim is. I think the only thing I could think that you could say the only way you could use the Dead Sea Scrolls to argue that Jesus existed is if you buy into these extreme fringe views that some of the scraps found there are Gospels, the Christian Gospels, the canonical Gospels even. But that case just cannot be made. There actually is no evidence of any Christian documents among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's now, pretty- If I may very quickly, though, for those who aren't familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were like almost a thousand different texts and they were discovered, what, half a century ago, supposedly consisting of actual biblical manuscripts. And they say, well, look, this was recently discovered and these are scriptural documents and they prove somehow that the Bible is true. Would that be a fair explanation of what they are? That's, I mean, that's how, the, that's the claim being made by the apologists. Okay. I mean, what it was, is it's a large collection of documents, not just biblical manuscripts. And we're talking Old Testament, not New Testament, but Old Testament manuscripts, pieces of them. We, I don't think a lot of them are not complete, for example, they're broken up and stuff. But uh, so we have, we have a lot of biblical manuscripts. We have tons of other manuscripts that these people, whoever stashed these scrolls, were treating as scripture that aren't in our Old Testament. So in fact, they're using a different Old Testament than ours. And so they're, they're using different books. And then there's a bunch of commentaries and a few other things like, uh, like community rules and things like that that are scattered among this. The traditional view is that there was a monastery at Qumran, a sort of isolationist Jewish sect that was hiding out there during the Jewish war, and they stashed basically the whole library in these caves, and that's where we found them. There have been some people who have challenged that view, but even the people who challenged that view agree that what happened was we have refugees from the Jewish war stashed their documents in these caves. So either way, it dates to about the 60s AD. Uh, so it's, it would be within 30 years of the life of Christ, for example. So that, that's why it's it's very tantalizing. Like very, you, you really would be interested in these documents because this is a, a good snapshot of Judaism right within the generation of the first apostles. Jesus Christ. I don't have much trouble getting past the, did the God-man exist? That's not a hard one for me, right? I, I came to reject that and the supernatural characteristics of Jesus. But there are many who say, well, there probably was a guy, some charismatic guy. He went out and he had a lot of followers and this mythology was based upon his true story. It just sort of took off and was embellished over the course of two millennium. Are you arguing that there was no actual original man, Jesus Christ, on which the mythology was based? Yeah, I, I argue probably not. I don't think we can be certain. I think the data is not sufficient to be absolutely certain. I would love to have more data. I would love to have more contemporary documentation to find out one way or the other. But I think the propensity of the evidence should lead us to conclude that there wasn't such a fellow. However, the theory you describe, I think, is the next most likely hypothesis. So even if I'm wrong about the non-existence of Jesus, what the evidence remaining does support is what you said, that he was just an ordinary charismatic man who got this movement started, and then these myths and legends grew up around him over time. And that's kind of, that's pretty much a widespread view in the scholarly community, certainly among the secular biblical scholars. Someone comes to you and they say, history says Jesus exists. In a nutshell, if I may, how would you refute that? Well, usually if, if someone's going to do that, you first have to ask them, well, how do you know? Like, what's your evidence? And then they would start listing stuff if they know anything. Oftentimes people just insist, well, all the scholars agree. And it's like, well, that's not really an argument. Because why do the scholars agree? What evidence are they citing? So you have to get back and look at the evidence to really know this. Uh, you can't rely on a fallacious argument from authority. And the reason is, in my book, Proving History, which the subtitle is Bayes' Theorem and the Quest for the Historical Jesus, I document not only myself, not only do I document that the reasons that scholars believe Jesus existed are invalid. They're, they're using logically invalid methodologies. Not only do I document that, but I actually, in the first chapter, document that every other scholar in the field, not fringe scholars, but actual mainstream scholars who have written, you know, have published analyses of these methods being used, Every single one of them agrees with me that the methods are invalid, they're not being used, and they can't be used the way that they're being used. So the method is invalid. So we know that the consensus has no foundation. It's not based on anything reliable. So what we need is a new method, and that's what I also explain in that book, is the method we need to, to pick up in, in place of these failed methods. And then we need to apply that method back to the evidence. We need to go back to the drawing board and relook at everything. And that's what I'll do in my next book. And I, what I do when, when I find out when I do that is that there's a really strong case to be made that, that originally Jesus was just a celestial visionary being. 
and that the gospel version of Jesus, this Jesus walking around on earth in history, is a myth that was invented to sort of allegorize and characterize the teachings and beliefs of this movement. Talking here with Dr. Richard Carrier, I have read accounts that there is no proof, there are no historical documents or, or references to a city called Nazareth until the 4th century BCE. Did you want to speak to that? It wasn't mentioned in any of the Old Testament books. It wasn't mentioned by Josephus. Is that accurate? Have you delved into the Nazareth question? I have. Um, that's a more difficult question to answer. Those things are true. Josephus doesn't mention them, but Josephus says there are some 200 villages in Galilee, and he only names us like a third of them. So, so the fact that Josephus doesn't name Nazareth doesn't mean it wasn't there. And the same with the Talmud, the fact that the Talmud, or the Old Testament. I mean, there were tons of towns that existed that didn't happen to be mentioned in the Talmud or the, or the Old Testament. And the claim usually made is the archaeology is suspect because there were certain Christian archaeologists whose methods have been challenged as being shoddy. So that there's questions about the custody of evidence and things like that and the way that it's been treated. But it's problematic because there's an actual working inhabited town sitting on top of Nazareth right now. And if you know anything about archaeology, you know that that means you're going to not be able to excavate most of the original town. Most of the original town is sitting underneath things that are already there, people's houses and buildings and things like that. So we can't make strong arguments from silence because we can't excavate the whole area. So we don't know what was really there. Even even if we throw out all the archaeology that's been done, that still doesn't get us to the conclusion that it, it didn't exist or that it didn't exist there. There could have been a Nazareth somewhere else, for example. So that I find, I find that argument from silence too weak there. The biggest problem for this argument against the existence of Nazareth is that uh, we have an inscription and it's a copy of a previous inscription and so on. I think the inscription itself dates to the 3rd or 4th century. But it's a copy of an inscription that was put up after the fall of the temple, of uh, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 AD. So this text goes back to 70 AD. And on it, it lists all of the villages that took in priests after this. Uh, because once the temple was destroyed, and that occurred in 70 and it was never rebuilt, once the temple was destroyed, the priests, they used to live there and conduct their business there, they had nowhere to go. So they had to be taken in. And so this inscription lists who took these priests in. So that, that tells us that this text was created in, in 70 or shortly after 70 AD. And among the towns there is Nazareth, very plainly listed in, I think, Hebrew or Aramaic. I can't remember the language of this inscription. So it's very plain that Nazareth obviously existed as of the 70s AD. So I think it's very, very unlikely that the town just happened to appear after the 30s. Basically, you're arguing, you'd have to argue that the town didn't exist when Jesus was born, but then did exist by 70 AD. I mean, that's possible, but it, it seems unlikely. And, and also because it can't have been renamed by Christians because Christians were viewed as heretics by the Jews and the, the Jews wouldn't take priests into a town that was named by heretics. You know what I mean? Uh, so it, clearly it was named by Jews of the time and, and not named by Christians and so on. So the town's name can't be based on the Gospels either. What I think probably happened is that um, there was a prophecy, and Matthew says this. Matthew says there's a prophecy, and we know Christians were using not only scriptures that we don't have, but versions of the of scriptures we do have that said different things than our versions do. And Matthew says that there was a prophecy that said Jesus would be a Nazarene. More specifically, it says Nazariah, which is a very different word. It actually doesn't correlate with the word Nazareth of the town. And then Matthew says, well, therefore, he was from Nazareth. I think that's the origin of placing Jesus at Nazareth. I don't think he was really born at Nazareth. Whether Nazareth existed or not is irrelevant to this argument, but it did exist by the time the gospel authors were writing, and they were trying to pick a town that would fit this prophecy, and so they picked an existing town, Nazareth, that did so. And the gospels were all written in the 70s and later, So, and we know the town existed by the 70s, so they didn't have to make up the town. And so I, I disagree with the, the very, very few scholars who argue that the town didn't exist and that the, the whole town was made up by the gospel authors. I don't agree with that theory. But the fact that Nazareth existed doesn't mean that there was an actual Jesus who came from there either. Do you look at that part of the world now and just see Disneyland? Everybody's traveling to the Holy Lands to walk the footsteps of Jesus. And they're traveling to the well and all of these landmarks. And, you know, they're selling their trinkets. Do you look at that and just think it is the temple and these are the money changers? What goes through your mind? <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it is it is very much a pilgrimage industry uh, that's been created there. That side of it is clearly largely bogus, and you can't really get much history out of that. Certainly, there's money to be involved. There's, there's tourism dollars to be involved. But also, there there's pride and religious faith to be reinforced. So, so there's all kinds of factors there that are generating claims that, that this is the hill that the Townsfolk of Nazareth were going to throw Jesus off of, even though the geographic location of that hill makes no sense. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this is that, that's the kind of nonsense we're talking about. But the, it's interesting, the pagans had the exact same kind of pilgrimage industry where they would invent places where Hercules fought some particular creature or something. So that's the place where Hercules did this or, you know, things of that nature. So this idea of creating a pilgrimage industry uh, is, is not something the Christians invented. It's been around for a long time. I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to mention it. How much of Jesus was plagiarized from other earlier gods? And I hear Horus is brought up all the time and, and many other pagan gods. And I think to myself, how much truth is there that Jesus is actually some sort of a composite or at least an echo of a previous God from another religion? Yeah, I think the idea of him being a composite is not a good theory. Uh, I don't think that explains very much. And you have to be careful with this kind of claim because there are a lot of these kinds of claims going around on the internet and in print, and they're often very factually challenged. The, the, they're often inaccurate in a number of respects. And so you have to be very careful with this material. Uh, for example, Horus. We have very little data that connects Jesus with Horus. We have more data that connects Jesus with Osiris. But that same data would connect Jesus with a general zeitgeist that Osiris is a part of. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus was a composite of various other gods. More likely what Jesus is, is a construction of a particular type of savior deity from Jewish principles. Because it's it's Christianity is really a syncretism between the mystery religions that were going on at the time and Judaism. It's, it's really a Jewish mystery religion. Uh, and so they took this basic mold, which is a, a dying and rising, suffering savior, son of God, who acquires power over death, and through that is able to impart that power over death to his followers through a communal meal and through something like a baptism. This basic structure that I just described characterizes all of the mystery religions. Even the ones that don't have dying and rising gods still have savior sons of God who undergo a passion, literally called a passion. They undergo some sort of suffering or struggle. It might not involve their death, but it involves something that they struggle or suffer through that gives them power over death. And so this, this is this common theme. So what you're seeing is this common basic skeletal structure of a savior deity being mapped into Judaism, and then it's being fleshed out not with other pagan gods, it's being fleshed out with attributes from Jewish expectations of the Messiah and previous Jewish apocalyptic thinking about uh, various deities and archangels and so on. So it's very Jewish. It's, it's more Jewish than pagan, really, but it has a, a really strong pagan component to it. Uh, but and it, this has to be understood in the proper context, and there's a lot of bad history going on about this. My next book on the historicity of Jesus Christ will thoroughly document the good history, the stuff that we can pull out and actually demonstrate is the case, both from Jewish influence and pagan influence. And there may be, may be more that we can't prove, but, uh, but what I document in the book is the stuff that we can really firmly say is the case. Is the virgin birth a common theme in many non-Christian religions? It is. Uh, and it's important to note that we have no evidence that there was a belief in a virgin birth before the Gospel of Matthew. There may have been. We don't know. Uh, but that seems to be something that was added to Jesus later. Uh, it wasn't necessarily something that had to do with the origin of the Christ idea. But it also had uh, Jewish concepts that may have inspired it. Uh, but it was also, yes, it was, a, it was a pagan concept as well. I've heard it said that it's a mistranslation. It means young woman of marriageable age. Is there any truth to that? In the Hebrew, yes, absolutely. I have an article online where I talk about this uh, and cite the scholarship. On, so on where they're looking at something miraculous, right? It was the Immaculate Conception. Well, the truth is, no, she was just young and, and she was of age. That's not all that exciting. The virgin birth sounds a whole lot sexier when you talk yeah. about it in religious terms, correct? That's true. But you have to realize also that the word was translated as virgin when the Jews created a Greek version of their Bible. And this was before Christianity. So there was already a Jewish text circulating in which the prophecy was converted into a prophecy of a virgin birth. So there was Jewish precedent for the Christians to import this idea of a virgin birth. And it's interesting that the Gospels very frequently rely on the Greek translation of the Bible for their ideas rather than the Hebrew original, because that tells you a lot about how uh, sophisticated and cosmopolitan Christianity really was. It, wasn't, it was very much a merger between 
Greek and Jewish. It wasn't a, a solely Jewish movement. Uh, and we see that in the Gospels, the fact that they're written in Greek and then they're basing their arguments often on the Greek Old Testament. And this idea of a virgin birth comes from the Greek version uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, so so that they had that precedent for it. But also the, the very idea, if you wanted a God to be the father of your deity, virgin birth was the best way to sort of sell that. It was kind of a, a, a typical marketing ploy to say, yeah, a virgin-born guy, therefore son of God. I mean, it was kind of a package deal. It was a way to, to, to promote your deity as a son of God rather than an ordinary son of man. Talking here with Dr. Richard Carrier, we keep coming back to the Gospels. You say they're myths, conjured up from imagination, or were they plagiarized from other holy texts from before, or both? <laughs> Forgive the broad question. I'm, what I'm trying to go after here is, is Christianity just simply borrowed from previous cultures? Well, yes and no. It is a new creation. But this is the case with all syncretism. All religious syncretism does this. They take religious ideas from one culture and religious ideas from another culture, pick and choose from them both, assemble them together, a completely new religion that combines elements from both. So it's both a new religion and it's a new religion made out of pieces of old religions. So it does borrow in many respects, but it also changes up. It also transforms. And this is very common with syncretism. I mean, one of the reasons that you engage in syncretism to create a new religion this way is to try and create a better religion than the ones that are around. Like usually what you'll see are people, sectarians like this, are looking around and they're disappointed with the form of Judaism that's around them. They're disappointed with the paganism that's around them. They think there's a better way. They think that they're getting God wrong. They think they're getting morality wrong. They think they're getting the wrong idea of how to structure society. So they have to come up with a new religion that basically proves that their vision for society, that their vision for cosmology and theology is correct. And so they do. They often change things up. So they'll revise, they'll, they'll borrow a story, but they'll change it. And the changing of it is the point of it. It's, it's the thing that they're trying to say is what's better about their religion than the thing that they're borrowing. So you get this borrowing with transformation. So you get a lot of that. In the, the formation of the Gospels, for example, the Gospels do, well, for example, certainly the Gospel of Mark gets a lot of ideas and structural elements and plot devices from Homer, for example. He's, this is, Dennis MacDonald has demonstrated this in a series of books where a lot of the story elements in Mark are Homerically inspired. Nevertheless, there's a large chunk of Mark and certainly of the other Gospels that's similarly inspired using the same literary techniques by the Old Testament. So, for example, stories about Moses get transformed into stories about Jesus. Stories about Elijah and Elisha get transformed into stories about Jesus. So they borrow these old Jewish hero stories from the Old Testament, rewrite them for the time and concept and, and setting of Jesus Christ, put Jesus in as the main character, and then make some changes to point out how their Jesus is different from Elijah or Moses and so on. Uh, and so there's a lot of that going on in the Gospels. Um, and uh, Thomas Brody and Randall Helms and various other scholars have all demonstrated this. You mentioned that the Gospels were written in 70? Well, the earliest gospel, the earliest we think the gospels could be written, this is the mainstream view, are the 70s. Uh, the, the usual traditional argument or the traditional conclusion is that Mark was written in the 70s, Matthew in the 80s, Luke in the 90s, and then John at the turn of the century. Now, how do you come to that conclusion? What evidence is there to support which decade we're talking about? This is that. What I just described to you is largely guesswork. There's really no real evidence to place these things. In reality, we can say that the Gospels that we have, the canonical Gospels, were probably, most probably, written between 70 and about 120 or 130 AD. We can't really honestly get any more precise than that. The arguments then get a little more vague. And, and the main reason is, for example, that the, the Gospels, certainly the Gospel of Mark, both explicitly and implicitly in the sort of parables and stories it tells, shows clear knowledge that the Jewish temple was no longer standing, that it had been destroyed. And it gives the impression that this is something that happened recently and needs to be explained. Uh, and so that suggests that, that Mark was written after the fall of the temple, which would be in 70, and not too much after, or at least that's what scholars argue. I think you could probably argue it may have been written more than that after, it may have been written in the 80s, may have been written even later. There's some scholars who argue it was written in the 130s, for example, and that's possible. I think it's less likely, but it just gives you an idea of how vague the data is. We're not really sure. But certainly after 70, probably closer to 70, and all the other Gospels copy from Mark in one way or another. Even the Gospel of John 
occasionally uses material from Mark, just not verbatim. So we know, you know, if we put Mark in the 70s, then the other Gospels have to be later. How you date the other Gospels, though, then becomes complicated because there's a lot of assumptions about the state of the Christian movement and so on, but we have no other corroborating documentation of what was going on in the church at this time. So we don't really know. And so that the, really the, the range of dates is between 70 and 130 about, give or take. They could have fallen anywhere in there. And, and we, we really and honestly can't be any more accurate than that. But the traditional view, the sort of uh, the sort of guesswork assumption is is that series of decades that I that I rattled off earlier. This tap dance just exhausts me. It seems it would exhaust anyone. There are billions of people who hold to the sixty six books of the Bible as absolute historical fact, and we don't even know when they were written. And do we know the author of any one book in the Bible? Can we verify any single author of any book at any time? Uh, in the New Testament. Uh, certainly, there are seven letters written by Paul that most scholars believe were actually written by Paul and were written in the 50s AD. Beyond that, we're not really sure. The other epistles, some of them are forgeries, we're pretty sure. The others that we're not sure are forgeries, we don't know whether the author, the name attached to them is the name of the author or not, or the name that was invented for it. And even if it's the name of the author, we don't know which person that is, for example, there's an epistle from James in the New Testament, but it doesn't explain which James that is. So we, we don't actually know who we're, who we're talking about there. And similarly with other authors, the Gospels don't say who they're written by at all. The only Gospel that even mentions a witness or having a source, for example, even mentions a specific source as a person is the Gospel of John. And that person is the, the so-called beloved disciple, which John doesn't even explicitly name. And the authors of John, and that's plural, authors, say that we got our information from this guy, right? So they don't even name him explicitly, and they say they got his information from this guy. But this guy that they're talking about is a character that appears nowhere in the story in any of the other Gospels. He seems inserted into the stories of the previous Gospels by the authors of John. So he seems to be an invented character. It's an invented source. Uh, and there, there's an author uh, by the name of Alan Cameron who wrote a book on Greek mythography, and he doesn't talk about this case in particular, but he talks about other examples where in Greek mythography, it was very popular to invent sources, even naming them. Uh, and so this is a common uh, thing in mythology is to invent a source and then say, hey, I got this information from this guy. And he was really there, you know, that kind of thing. So we know this was a trend. So I don't think we can even trust that. But even that, again, John does not explicitly name this guy. And I think when you analyze the text, who they mean is Lazarus who is an invented character uh, for reasons that I've talked about in other venues before. He was invented by John to argue against the fictional Lazarus that Jesus talks about in Luke. And so, so here we have really the Gospel of John is written by a couple of, or a, a, plural, a plurality of authors who don't identify who they are, who say that they're reading some other book that we don't have by this other disciple who they don't name except to suggest that he's Lazarus, who is a fictional character. So <laughs> that gives you an idea. But I know it's all true. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the frustrating part. I mean, and I get conviction. People have been raised to hold this book to their chest with absolute allegiance, right? They're usually products of family and culture, and they just know, I just know the Bible is true. And yet we have no real idea who these people were. So now we get into all of the different incarnations of scripture, right? It's being passed down. It's being transcribed time and time again. And each person who does so is what they're adding, they're subtracting, they're enhancing. Maybe it's clerical error that changes the body of the text. How has this affected scripture over the years? Yeah, all of those things were happening to all of the documents. Uh, and we have, we have extensive examples of this in all the manuscripts. We have, we have tons of manuscripts, usually from later centuries, some scraps from earlier centuries, but we can tell from all of them that there was a rather high rate of this kind of error or alteration of the text. I wrote an article online, which you can find at the Errancy Wiki website, on the ending of Mark. Mark ends originally, as far as we can tell, ended with the women running away from the tomb and never telling anyone, which is a strange, never telling anyone what happened, which is a strange way to end a book that you, if you want that book to be taken seriously as history. But this was an uncomfortable ending for Christians. And so very early, very quickly, they started adding new endings and different Christians were adding different endings. So there's basically five different endings uh, that were added on. And some just took the ending that was there and inserted material, some tacked material on to the end, some even added material to the material that was tacked onto the end. So, so, you, so you have a forgery on top of a forgery, basically. So, so we know this kind of thing happened. And there are other examples, the um, book of Luke and Acts as one unit uh, 
We have two versions of that, one of which is almost 20% longer than the other. And so, they, so they, they have different material in them. And of course, the one that appears in your printed Bible on the bookshelf is only one of those two versions. And so that's just an example. There are, there are lots of other incidences like that where you can look at a manuscript and find all kinds of things that have been changed. For example, there was an early manuscript of Matthew where someone ascribed didn't like the fact that he didn't mention the spearing incident in John. You know, in the Gospel of John, uh, is the only gospel that says this, that Jesus gets a spear in the side while he's hanging on the cross, and then blood and water oozes out from the wound. That was never heard of by any of the other gospel authors. It was invented by John, and it was probably invented by John to echo the Cana miracle of turning water to wine, because those two scenes, the crucifixion and the Cana miracle, have many parallels, and they're intentional parallels. But we have this manuscript of Matthew where a scribe took that line from John about him being speared and the, and the blood and water coming out and inserted it into the crucifixion account in Matthew. So we have an extra line being added into the Gospel of Matthew. And this happened fairly early on. and We have, we have an early manuscript that shows this. So, so we know this kind of thing is going on a lot. And that's just one example among many. You draw a circle around something I do want to mention here. Most people do not read the Gospels side by side, right? They read them in a linear fashion. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But the truth is, if you look at these stories, even the story of the crucifixion, the discovery of Jesus' tomb, and so many others, if you look at them side by side, the details do not match up. And yet most people don't catch this. You find that's a common thing? Yeah. Well, I did. I discuss this less often now with 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 uninformed laymen. I used to interact with them more. Now, I'm, because I'm dealing with, um, I'm trying to convince secular scholars in the field of a particular theory, I've been dealing more and more with secular scholars in the field. And of course, they are already aware of this fact. So I, I deal with it less now. I'm amazed um, in the church, though, at how prevalent it is if you say, well, actually, Jesus' last words are different in this book as they are in this book as they are in this book. And they're like, really? I think it's because we're used to being spoon-fed information from the pulpit, right? We assume, or we read in a linear fashion. But it's there's a lot of these examples of conflicts of contradictions in scriptures and the Gospels. I think Bart Ehrman makes that point explicitly, if I recall, in Jesus Interrupted. I think like his first chapter, he talks about the fact that the things that he's going to talk about in that book, which are scandalous to the lay community, Community, but are mainstream to the scholarly community, uh, he says are not being communicated to the public by preachers and so forth, even though these preachers from the pulpit have gone through seminary and know all of this stuff, but they're not telling their congregations it. And Ehrman says that that was one of the reasons he wrote the book, and he's right about that. Do people send you proof? Hey, Dr. Carrier, you're way off. Jesus did exist. Here's proof. Does that happen? It happens less and less. I think largely because I've written more and more about it. They already know. Uh, they go looking for the so-called proof, and they realize I've already rebutted it. But no, that did happen a lot. And there was an example just recently. Um, another graduate student in ancient history uh, by the name of Matthew Wade Ferguson ran into this apologetic that I hadn't heard about, but apparently is going around. And it was amusing because it got thrown at me in North Carolina recently, and it was I was so surprised and delighted. But uh, let me tell you the story. It's called the 1042 Apologetic. And the argument is that there's 42 historical sources that prove that Jesus existed and only 10 that confirm that the emperor Tiberius existed. And Tiberius would have been the emperor during the time that Jesus was crucified. And so the thinking is, is if there's 42 references to Jesus and 10 references to Tiberius, and you believe Tiberius existed, then you should conclude that Jesus existed, you know, argument a fortiori. That's that's the thing. Uh, well, uh, Matthew Wade Ferguson did a blog on this. I cross-blogged it. I blogged about it and pointed people to it and told them that this is an awesome blog post. Uh, but he, he tears this apart in detail. And in reality, the numbers are far the reverse. Uh, we have vastly better evidence for the existence of Emperor Tiberius than we have for Jesus. And Ferguson goes through point by point by point how the evidence differs in each case. And it's really astonishing. And it's clear, and he even traced, this is another thing, is he traced where this argument came from. It's like, how did this begin? Who who started claiming this? And he traced it back to certain Christian apologists in a certain written book who were clearly misinforming the public because they had to have known that they are misrepresenting the facts in this case. And so, and, but yet it gets disseminated and then Christians just start repeating it, not realizing that they've been duped, that this is, this is not a valid argument. And just this month, in fact, in North Carolina, I was giving a talk on the historicity of Jesus in Greensboro on the campus there. And one of the questions was from a Christian and, and he, he repeated this argument to me, clearly unaware that I had blogged about the complete and thorough devastating refutation of it. And he actually used, and he used the numbers too, which I was delighted. I was like, oh, thank you. Excellent. So someone's using the argument. Uh, and so I, I explained everything to him that I just explained to you. And go read that blog. That's the, that's the thing. If you want to see that argument destroyed. And it's especially pleasing to me to see that kind of work done 
not only because it refutes and nips in the bud this apologetic argument that's going around, uh, this false claim, but it's also in the process, Ferguson gets to really educate the reader in all kinds of things about ancient history, about ancient coins and, and inscriptions, and about certain authors and so on. So it's it's a really good teaching tool just for the, the field of ancient history itself, completely apart from the issue of Christianity that's generating interest in the article. And as a teacher, I really love seeing that, to see something that, that people can be passionate about and interested in and, and go read, and then in the, and walk away having learned tons of really cool stuff about the ancient world completely apart from whether Christianity is true or not. For our listeners, I will link to these blogs that we're referencing just for easy access in the description box of this podcast. So if you're scrambling, relax, I've got links just for you. I skipped over it. I want to go back. I know we're talking about modern day apologists and many of the debates you've had and whatnot, but I want to go back to the process of the canonizing of scriptures. Can you give us sort of the Reader's Digest version? How were the 66 books of the Christian Bible selected? Oh, yeah. Well, if you're talking 66, that's including the Old Testament, right? Yeah, the old and the new, but I mean, take me wherever you want on this score. I want the idea that humans had to to convene to have counsel to decide which of God's books would be included to me sounds a little insane. <laughs> you know, hey, let's have flawed human, subjective human beings come together and decide which of God's words are worthy to be passed on. And I've always been really fascinated by the process. I was hoping you could speak to the process of canonization, old or new. Yeah, it's really worse than, than you make it sound because by the time the councils, in, the Council of Nicaea, for example, that people often reference is not one of those councils, but there were other councils around that time and after that we're trying to decide what books to include in the canon. But in reality, the canon had already been decided by that point. So the councils were really just rubber stamping something that was tradition by the time it came to them. There were a few marginal texts around the orbit that they were sort of deciding whether wishy-washy, whether to include or not include. Um, but but pretty much the canon was, was locked down already before these councils were met. And it, there's a book by, um, I think it's called The First Edition of the New Testament by Trobish, David Trobish. And it's a fascinating book, and he, he gave a good talk on it at Amherst uh, at a convention I was at as well. And he points out that if you look at the manuscript evidence itself, not just the textual evidence, but the manuscript evidence, the actual symbols and things that are written in the manuscripts that we have, it looks like one person assembled the New Testament that we have, that he chose the order of the books, he chose which books to include, and possibly which versions to prefer over other, because there were different versions of it. And that this one version of the Bible is the one that got well marketed and became really popular. And there were certain other Christian groups that tried adding to it or tinkering with it, but by and large, the main skeletal structure of it remained the same, and that became the so-called canon. Uh, and it was you know, eventually ratified by committee 100 or 200 years later. And the interesting thing is it looks like this was done specifically to argue against another canon the first canon, which was assembled by the Martianites, by Martian, who was a less prominent heretic, or what the orthodoxists would call a heretic, he assembled his own canon. And he, he appears to be the first one to do this, to actually assemble a, a canonical set of books that would be the New Testament. Uh, we don't have that, by the way. We have quotations of it, we have references to it, descriptions of it, but we don't have the original canon. And this was seen as a threat. And so someone soon after that, very soon after that, within 10, 20, maybe at most 30 years, put together their own anti-Martianite canon, and that canon is the one that we have now. And so it's really a polemical rebuttal to the version that was going around before. And yet that first canon by Martian was his own tinkering. He had modified texts as well. So he took texts that were still in circulation and changed them up for his own purposes. So even that wasn't a reliable canon. So you, you can get the picture here of what's going on. It's more a question of political and PR and, and uh, polemical and theological battling that's going on. They're, they're not so much concerned with which texts are actually reliable. Of course, they're marketing the texts that they're selling as being the true ones, right? But the reason they're choosing them have more ulterior political motives and religious and dogmatic motives and are not based on researching who the books were written by and whether they're reliable and stuff. Just the mere fact that the New Testament has forgeries in it, which most scholars agree, confirms the fact that they weren't really interested in authentic literature, that they were more interested in what ideology they could sell and what churches they could get under their umbrella and therefore what resources they could gather in this battle for control over the church. And so that was the kind of political thinking that went into the forming the canon. Most of this happened in the second century where we have very little documentation to know exactly what was going on. We can just kind of reconstruct hints and ideas of what happened based on what little information has survived. Well, I can tell you right now what the problem is. You're not reading it in the original King James. 
I always answer that when I hear things like that, that, you know, you do realize that the Muslims require all adherents to read the Quran in the original Arabic, right? You can't be a Muslim and read their book in a translation because a translation is a human interpretation of the word of God, right? Which makes a lot more sense. It doesn't make sense to me that Christians rely on a human interpretation and then make that the inerrant thing, the translation, the English translation, rather than learning Greek and reading the New Testament in its original language, the language it was actually written in. Uh, the Muslims seem to have one way over on the Christians on this one. It does seem odd that if heaven and hell are in the balance, God's method for communicating to his beloved children is to drop this message in a region and time where proper historical records could not be kept. And it's a massively confusing thing. Somehow this doesn't alarm people. It doesn't bother people that the omnipotent deity could simply just pull back the curtain of the sky and solve the mystery. Instead, we're haggling. We're doing the apologist tap dance over all of these ancient texts, and we don't even know really who wrote them, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I mean, you you go right to the, the point that, you know, God could, like you say, said, roll back the curtain of heaven and just expose everything right away. You know, he could literally talk to us, just literally like dial our heads and talk to us and answer any question we had right now all the time constantly, right? So we could live in a world where that was the case. Uh, so, so if there was a real God, that's what he could do and probably what he would do. But it, it's amusing enough to, to point out that the one thing that Jesus would have been, the most important thing that Jesus could have done in terms of spreading the gospel is explain to them the printing press, right? You think this... <laughs> You know what? I'm going to write my own book. I'm not going to trust you guys to write it. I'm going to write my own book, and then I'm, there's this thing called a printing press, and it will, we'll be able to mass produce exact copies, and they'll be much more reliable. You know, <laughs> yeah. or you know, let's do wax cylinder recording. Let's do an audio recording of the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Well, why not? You know, <laughs> talking here with Dr. Richard Carrier. A final few minutes. I just want to get personal, if I can. You call yourself an atheist? I do. You are an absolute atheist. You do not believe in any god anywhere at any time. That's correct. Yeah. I think it's extremely improbable. Yeah. You're on the circuit. I mean, you're taking the pulse of the culture, which really seems to be shifting. Or am I reading that wrong? It seems, especially with the 30 and under crowd, we're starting to see a rise in critical thinking when it comes to what were sacred religions. Are you seeing some echoes of that in the culture? Oh, absolutely. Yes. There, there is definitely a shift occurring. And it is, it is heavily in the, the younger generation. I think something like a quarter, uh, if not higher, of... Um, of that generation identify as, as non-religious. Uh, and even when you look at like actual people who declare to be atheists, the rate is has always been small, but it's still much higher among that demographic than the older generations. So I really see this happening. And it's, it's very pervasive. It's not just a trend towards atheism and secularism, but it's a really big shift away from organized religion and dogma. Because I'm seeing also, I, I also speak to Christian groups, and I've often spoken to Christian youth groups, for example. So I meet a lot of young people in the Christian movement as well. And I've also read a lot of the alarmist literature by Christian intellectuals and leaders. They're really worried about the fact that their churches are hemorrhaging youth. I mean, they're, they're just losing them hand over fist, which they realize that their movement is doomed, that Christianity as they know it is doomed if they can't keep these young people churched. And so they come up with all these sort of strategies to try and get them back, and they're usually terrible strategies, but uh, but that's their own problem. But uh, the significant thing I'm seeing is a huge trend towards the youth creating their own Christianity, essentially doing the Martin Luther thing uh, and, and rebelling against the mainstream religion that is trying to control their ideas and their morality and trying to dictate to them how they should control and mold society. The youth are rebelling against that idea and saying, no, 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 we're going to do our own thing. We're going to figure out Jesus on our own. And they have different interests. They are not interested in opposing gay marriage. They're not interested in uh, abortion very much. They're interested in poverty in Africa. You know, they're interested in social justice and they're interested in these, these things that really matter. And so it's interesting to see this, that, that they're actually taking Christianity in a direction that's actually more traditionally Christian, that's more of the Christian ideal of what they think Christianity should be. And yet it's the, the elite, the Christian mainstream that's alarmed by this. You know? <laughs> well, how much of this is the information age? How much has the internet played a part in this sort of changing of the culture? I think it's been decisive. I think it's been one of the most important things. And I see it, I, I can confirm this not just because 
I see it happening in the religion field, but I see it in other domains as well, not in this domain specifically, but even in other areas where I'm seeing the situation where parents can't get away with lying to their kids anymore. You can't tell them something like, you know, everybody who has sex gets an STD, for example, or, you know, you can't claim things like that because they'll immediately just pick up their mobile device, Google it, and immediately disconfirm what you just said. And so the, the ability, the access to information that you can't stop that these kids have is allowing them to really rapidly and decisively challenge authority. And that's changing, I think, that's changing our culture fundamentally. Now, Uh, the dark side of that, though, is that as much good information is out there, there's probably a whole lot more bad information. And differentiating between the two is even more critical. Yes. And what I'm also seeing, uh, and now this is something I can't, because I I often hang out with smarter people, even on the Christian side. uh, So I don't know to what extent this is a trend. Uh, I hope it's a trend. But that very fact that you point out is evident. It's very apparent to this this younger generation. And what what they're doing is they're realizing that and they're starting to muddle their way and develop skills to discern good from bad information. They're, they're actually aware of the fact that the internet has widely skewed differing views. And the response to that is to try and figure out how do we know what to trust? What is the reliable source? What is the concept of a reliable source? So they're actually thinking about these things and struggling with these things. And that's a good sign. At the same time, I do see a lot of them, of course, do the verification bias thing and only trust sources that tell them what they want to hear, for example. If Jesus proved himself today, would you follow him? Possibly. Uh, In my book, uh, Why I Am Not a Christian, I talk about what it would take for Jesus to convert me, essentially, uh, and I talk about it in detail there. It's possible, sure. Uh, It would depend on what he said and what he did. Ultimately, it's about truth, right? We're not looking to kill God. We're looking to find out what the evidence supports. That's really the bottom line for all of us. Yeah, that is my main objective, and that's the one thing that I want to get right. Dr. Richard Carrier, if someone wanted to go deeper, uh, is there a starting book or a starting blog or website you recommend for my listeners? Well, for my stuff, you want to follow my work, my books, my blog, uh, my online writings of various kinds. Just go to richardcarrier.info. That's my warehouse, my, my main website. You can get to everything from there. And also, if you want to support my work, there is uh, advice and ideas there for ways you can help support me and continue doing the things that I do. And as far as books go, just go into that bookstore, look at the list of books that I have, and you'll see the kinds of things I've written, whatever interests you in whatever field you're interested in. You can check it out. And you might have a chance to shake his hand in Austin, Texas at the American Atheist Convention. And of course, he speaks all around the country. For your time and for a fantastic interview, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Coming up next Tuesday night... On the podcast, we're going to be talking about morality and ethics without God. Where do your morals come from? And we'll present a series of moral dilemmas to our listeners and see exactly how they might respond. I'm going to be on the road this week. Again, the tour is scheduled, thethinkingatheist.com. And special thanks to our podcast supporters. By the way, if you'd like to donate and support the site and the shows, you can go to the podcast tab at thethinkingatheist.com. Have a great week. I will see you next time on The Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com